so very briefly, uh, Luca Brunner from uh, ZKM. I guess everyone knows who he is. I no introduction necessary. <laughs> it's being it's being recorded, so there are five thousand people who are watching. But every every mistake, uh, every wrong fact, I'm um, giving. Um, maybe well, there are. I, I try to to do a logical line, to create a logical line for spatial audio and I started uh, with uh, uh, an experiment with a, to, to show you, maybe you know all of this fact, but I want, want to make them very clear and try to summarize all of uh, the facts I have. Uh, as a composer I found uh, arguments which are pro-spatial uh, audio, then I go back to a historical kind of overview of what did, who did what when in a very sh sh short uh, way and then I go slowly migrate to the current uh, system we have at ZCAM. Yeah, so that's you know, that's what I try to do. Okay, for those of you who didn't see the pictures of the ZKM, this is the building and the blue part actually is a ZKM, the white part is the School of Design, the Bauhaus idea putting together uh, education, uh, production and presentation. Uh, the, uh, there are ten, uh, ten light yards, we call them light yards, the numbers are a little, little bit uh, shifted. Um, and uh, one and two on the right is the Museum for Contemporary Art. Uh, six is the uh, entrance hall, no, is the media theater, seven is the entrance hall, eight and nine is the uh, museum, uh, media museum. So this is the same from the front. And this is one of the light yards, the entrance hall, basically. And this is what we are going to talk about, uh, spatial audio. So, like psychoacoustic facts, always it's not uh, completely scientific, because otherwise I would have, have to uh, choose another approach. I think you, you know probably many of the research done and you know the related uh, uh, psychoacoustic facts. I start with the example. And, well, for those who don't know, score high means this, the upper note is higher than the lower note. I start with a trill, and I have a trill just in the mono version. Very nothing special. Then the next example shows uh, the trill in a stereo version. So I put one, the red uh, note, I put on one side, the uh, gray note onto the other side, and you know what happens. The integration of the figure is kind of blurred a bit. So you have a, um, you already start to have a, uh, create an ambiguity in, you are able to focus on the left side, you are able to focus on the right side. And even if you sit on the right side, you'll probably hear more the, the note on the right side than, uh, than the other one. So there's already uh, in this, let's say, homogeneous, uh, very simple uh, gestalt, uh, there's already a depth of interpretation uh, brought into by random situation of your, of your placing, of your sitting, or if you're moving by your uh, chose, uh, choice. And um, this, especially if you're moving, I think this already brings a very interesting point in, into the situation. The signal becomes interactive. You can investigate the signal, you can inter interpret the signal, and this is a, such an important fact in, in spatial audio. <coughs> so the next... So it makes it less less strong. The and also, uh, and also this room mixes. Yeah. A mixer. That's true. Um, okay. The next example. You probably might have known that there is one, even one other interpretation, left and right, and the mix between left and right. The other interpretation is the moving of, of uh, the node to the left and to the right. Uh, and I've try to make this a bit more clear with a, with a accelerando, with a speed up of the signal, so that you uh, can experience the migration of 
stable node uh, versus um, moving node. So that's the second interpretation level or, or effect you would face when, when the sound is placed spatial, that you have this kind of moving uh, 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 action. state where you uh, can't, cannot hear the moving anymore, uh, it's a different uh, one because you have still the separation of the pitch identity on the left and right. Now the next is going to be a bit more musical, I thought, but I don't know what this is. Ah, yeah, and now I introduce another parameter, that's the timbre, uh, because I want to try, uh, I want to show as well the interaction between timbre, for example, and space. Um, and if you choose right side uh, one note, left side other note, right side one timbre, left side other timbre, you have such a clear separation of uh, the signals. I mean, it's uh, very, it becomes very strong. tries to uh, incorporate uh, or introduce a rhythm, a rhythmic spatial pattern. Uh, uh, so that is, this is working against the regularity of the pitch pattern. Uh, because we have already uh, at least two parameters, timbre and pitch and space, into the, uh, introduced at the same time. happening uh, with uh, the given information. The, the, the information is really, uh, let's say, uh, uh, modified quite, uh, uh, quite strongly. Um, and let's go even further, introduce now uh, the timbre and this, this pattern uh, and left and right and Basically, what we have now is a kind of fractal structure. Uh, you see the, the grays, uh, the grays are the, the small intervals, the blues are the small intervals a little bit augmented, and the reds are the uh, interval even more augmented, and the purple are the interval even more, more augmented. Mm -hmm. But of course, this is not all audible, but uh, I, I found it as a composer interesting which kind of structure you could incorporate in this simple trill. And let's go on and introduce even more um, accent into the structure. case what we are doing here because uh, we are uh, I did not somehow uh, optimize things it's a, a, a used material which is everyday material I use timer which are everyday timer we have a positioning of speaker which are is a normal speaker uh, position the only thing which is probably different is not always the pitches are or the locations are in front of left and right because they are almost significant 
So sometimes they are above your head or they are indeed behind, uh, so they become even a bit less significant than this example. But uh, I think it is a, a clear case to, to show what structure uh, ability uh, space uh, uh, has. And um, uh, I think uh, we all know to some extent uh, uh, how to compose, we know, we learn how to put instruments, how to do phrases, accents, staccato, legato, all of this uh, articulation uh, parameters, but you, you never learn how to deal with space in this context. I mean, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a topic at all. It's, of course, uh, more and more compositions come up where they introduce the space, like placing a musician here, placing another musician uh, behind the uh, audience, etc. There are, there are some more and more cases, but I would say uh, the, the knowledge, the ability to musical handle uh, space is cr pretty small somehow. And I, mean, I, I start to, out of that reason, I start with the history again to show. I mean, we ha we had cases, we have a long experience where we could have jumped into the uh, topic of space. But it, uh, it happened in a certain so context, but not uh, on a wide uh, uh, range. And I, I think probably the third century is the, the third um, millennium is the, is the time, the beginning of the third millennium is a time where space is really becoming the parameter, uh, the, the, uh, or evolving, the most evolving parameter. Um, maybe I, I should show, uh, as, a, as another example, the, the piece we heard yesterday, I've uh, prepared a stereo version of that and compared just in a short uh, view with uh, we see uh, 16 channel. So that gives, uh, I think that might give a good uh, impression about the difference. Now I start at 412, so I try to start. Relative to the previous example where note groupings were a function of tempo difference, you know, new, new or loops by Robert Erickson and John Gray's implementation of that in maybe 1973 or four. Mm -hmm. So it's just a simple melodic pattern. pattern. Every instrument was maybe six different woodwinds were to play each of the notes. Of course, in performance, it was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. But uh, John Gray did an version called Do Loops. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very interesting kind of piece sound based yeah. upon this idea. And yeah. Which all goes back to Bregman's, mm -hmm. Alfred, Alfred Bregman's work in audio scene and auditory scene yeah. analysis. Yeah, it is so interesting that uh, the groundwork, the research, uh, is existing for a long time. It's already yeah. there and uh, it's not incorporated by the musician. Of course, one reason is. Uh, a player, musical player, is not uh, easy to move. Second, the convention of a stage, uh, uh, the, the performance situation, uh, and third, I think it is a musical practice. How how would I learn? How would I use? Uh, uh, it, or, uh, how would I take advantage of this space? Mm -hmm. um, now let's see this. I try to start uh, the stereo version in the same position as the uh, 16 channel version so that we have a comparable situation. Confess there there were uh, there are inter-all time delays in the, in the signal, so it's 
it's not a pure uh, as pure as it should be, but uh, um, I, I think uh, the example shows anyway very clearly the difference. that we have uh, a much better separation, of course, uh, obviously, but as well we could identify uh, the, the objects with um, higher ease. Um, the, the analysis was kind of, so it was so clear you could sing la, la, this, this version, that uh, uh, voice, yeah, the recognition is, is uh, much clear, much more clear than uh, on the stereo version. Um, I, I will try another moment where you have a high density of uh, uh, sounds uh, to, to at least give, uh, give an idea of another musical sit or, uh, sonic situation. And it now this is a bit louder than the, the one before. <coughs> So what we could at least uh, clearly hear was this 
kind of muddiness of the sound, which was less uh, there. It was always very uh, clear. The, the masking effect of the, all the uh, uh, covering uh, uh, frequencies, as well. It was. I think it was clear that the, the kind of physical appearance of a sound was it a big sound or a small sound? Uh, was it uh, uh, the speed? Was the separation was much uh, as well much better uh, audible? Um, even the kind of uniform signal was a part uh, you could s s uh, segregate in, into certain sub uh, sections coming from different uh, angles. Uh, it's basically, I think, uh, very obvious what uh, what the difference between these environments is. Okay, now go. Let's go back to the to the um, keynote. And I try to summarize these facts uh, uh, verbally uh, in, uh, in these three hypotheses. Uh, spatial sound environment enables an interactive and flexible perception. We already talked about, mentioned this. With the help of space, additional structural information can be applied. That's what I did with the trill. Additional rhythms, additional internal uh, structures. Um, uh, and inside an immersive environment, more information can be perceived. I mean, the quantity, more timbre information can be perceived because something like the masking effect, I uh, uh, mentioned this already. And I try to, to add on, first of all, you have the audible focus effect. Uh, that means, first, it's a stage of interactive listening. You can decide what to focus on. That's a quite dramatic uh, uh, change. Uh, sound seeds get a perspective and depth layering. So you have a sound which is closer to yourself, so sounds are further to yourself. My uh, dream is, for example, to have an investigatable uh, Beethoven's number no. 9 orchestra placed here and uh, just walk through the, to the double bass or to the first violin, to the second violin. And, it, uh, understand the piece in a different way, uh, and I think it, uh, there's potential for the future, even for classical music, because uh, no orchestra would uh, let the people walk through, the, through through them while they are playing. And uh, it is, uh, as you can see in the score, the the, the, the details, how rhythms, how um, tremolo are translated in, in the orchestra are quite rich. Uh, gives rich structural information, especially in uh, very dense structures, like think of the Ligeti Fugue uh, or Canon, uh, where you would have uh, one violin closer to yourself and then a depth layering of the second uh, further away violin and further, further away violin, where you have a complete different uh, um, way to investigate uh, music. Then, um, of course, as I mentioned, uh, less masking of sounds, uh, which uh, is, of course, dependent on uh, the uh, position of the listener, and uh, either the position in concert, or uh, if you have a, a walking concert where you're in an installation, uh, the chosen position of the listener, I mean, the, the actively chosen position and through the piece, it, uh, if you have a uh, have not a fixed seating, uh, you can even more investigate uh, the sounds. But this uh, lead to the to a performance, for example, where you don't have, where you first of all can be active through the process of listening, but as well you can have different performance. I mean, the same piece performed, you you are sitting somewhere else, and the speakers are placed a bit differently. You get quite a different result. But we have to give up the perfect. Uh, acoustic result for that. That's that's uh, the trade we have to do. Uh, but I think this uh, means that, uh, that the music is more closely becoming, even as a, as a fixed media uh, piece, it's becoming uh, more uh, equal to a musical performance by a performer. Okay, then the arguments for the help um, for this uh, for the structural information. Um, that's what I've shown. Grouping with patterns can be realized in space. Gestural information uh, can be applied uh, 
to the sound using space. It's, uh, for example, maybe you notice when you're walking on the street, you have a sound, uh, a car is doing psh, and then another car is doing and you have psh, and then you have a third, uh, uh, you have sometimes sometime very funny groupings of sounds that you create a phrase even though they were uh, uh, apart. But as well, at the same time, you realize uh, that this information are creating, a, let's say, a triangle, a geometric form. Uh, so a kind of gestural, spac spatial gesture. Uh, and that's something where we have to in still investigate. And uh, in the piece uh, by Glashaber, there you, you have a lot of single uh, events. And you, you know this from, from Weber and this kind of grouping uh, activity of our brain. Uh, of course, uh, Weber actively uh, um, introduce the grouping by phrasing for us, but uh, we are anyway uh, kind of uh, structuring information by our nature. But uh, through space, we have a different uh, or an additional way how to group uh, things and how to introduce a gesture without uh, modifying the the, the musical um, uh, parameters, basically. The, sonoric parameters except for the space so we can have a certain uh, articulation uh, pitch uh, and timbre material and then apply on top of this without changing these the, uh, the so sonic, uh, motion without yeah. 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 Um, yeah that's gestalt identities I mean this is uh, uh, basically what I, what I said for and uh, the third, inside an immersive environment, more information can be perceived. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way you can do a negative image. By oh, yeah. Command shift alt. There's, I can't read these. Ah, okay. Eight. Yeah. Command shift alt eight. Or okay. Three buttons. Uh, oh, they're from the entire uh, inside, or inside, in the ac inside the active mode? Or? No, no. It's, it's a Mac, Mac thing. So it's command option control eight. And um, option control eight. Yeah, yeah, if it's enabled. No. It didn't happen. So then you have to go to um, accessibility and enable that. Um, it's just a reverse video. Okay. Um, I can wait, I can check quickly change the letters. That's no problem. Yeah, just a uh, different. Uh, maybe make them black or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Maybe modulate them spatially. Good <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I somehow I couldn't really get rid of the shade. Maybe that was creating additional problems. But okay. Um, it's also a little blurry. Yeah. Uh, Oh, you know what? I bet your uh, display settings are optimized for the retina display instead of the external display. But you get this kind of blurring. There's a drop shadow on the font. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Yeah, drop it's a drop shadow on the font. It's, it's that. It's uh, other text on the font, I think. Okay. Okay. Um, simulation of spatial acoustic. Well, that was one idea. I never heard that, but I know that. Uh, some people at Kama as well were 20 years ago already trying to investigate uh, reverberation incorporating space uh, like uh, uh, reflection directions uh, uh, or ray tracing. I mean, uh, we know that it's a tricky thing because very uh, CPU taking a lot of uh, CPU power, but it is a thing uh, which well, we don't know what, what, will be the, what will be possible in the future. But there, at least with a spatial environment, you can get completely different results, more, uh, yeah, more interesting results uh, than with, with inside the stereo system. Jot did a lot of work in there, right? Jean-Marc Jot? Yeah, Jot. And there's a new, um, there's a new method uh, that, that, that works really well. It, it's a physical, um, you basically think of um, you make a waveguide network where each waveguide is the length of a wall-to-wall -wall separation, and then there's this coupling that, uh, that 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 essentially gives you the same buildup of echo density and direction with quantization to you know the center of the wall basically. Mm -hmm. So if you go out you know 
you know, you think of the image method where you, you know, replicate the room in all directions, then when you're, uh, let's say you have a point source that, that goes out, when you get to, uh, you know, about 15 rooms out or something like that, then you get a very good approximation of what's going on. And, and the total echo density is correct on average. Mm -hmm. and, and the direction of arrival is pretty close. And especially, mm -hmm. and it gets better and better through time. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an interesting technique. Uh, we had a visiting scholar here, uh, uh, Zoran, who, uh, I'm blanking on his last name right now. Sviatovich. Thank you. I, I could not even say that. So, uh, <laughs> So, and his, uh, his student, um, uh, his the lead person that got his thesis in this area, Enzo, is his student, and, and this paper is going to be appearing, and, and it, I, I consider it a, a big step forward in, you know, really simulating spaces mm -hmm. efficiently. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can send you the paper pre if you Yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> so, yeah, that, that's the new uh, state of the art physical reverb. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And, um, well, that's one thing uh, I, we found out uh, using speakers above. Uh, there were, uh, at least in Germany, there were a, a lot of people complaining, kind of, I don't want the source, sound source to be uh, uh, above my head. Uh, no one was used to do that, and uh, they m were much in favor of Wavefield because of that, uh, Wavefield systems. Um, but uh, first of all, I. We, we all know that, uh, at least the Wayfield systems I've heard, uh, they were not really very good inside with uh, sound inside uh, uh, the, the space. Uh, and so this was the sound home was much more convincing uh, in placing uh, a clear um, uh, localization uh, cue for, for, the, for you. Uh, and uh, the, the thing is, which comes later, we want to extend the stage. We don't want to have stereo in front or, you know, uh, something outside of the circle. We want as well want to have the, everything inside the circle, which would be ideal, but at least the sound dome with the VBUB system would be, you have a stage which is uh, all positions inside the space are available. That means an extension of space. That means you can be, place more sounds, you can be more complex in, in the sonic uh, material you're using. Um, and Well, the immersiveness is another uh, very interesting topic. Uh, uh, did you ever, for example, have the uh, difference between the experience being on a street uh, and uh, all cars are surrounding you, or you have the, the same signal in front of you as a stereo image? I, I think it's, it's, a complete, it's a clear signal to the body, you are part of that uh, 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 environment, first of all. Um, and now think of a Beethoven symphony, you are inside the symphony. Uh, it is a complete different relationship between you, my, and the object I'm observing. Because uh, in the frontal uh, display, I'm always separated from the object. I'm the observer and there is the object. That's very clear in the, in the uh, classical uh, situation. <coughs> But in an immersive situation, of course, you are inside the object, and so I think music is becoming more strong. It's uh, it's it's an environment. M music is becoming an environment, and that's an interesting uh, thinking, uh, especially I think, especially with complex electronic music. Mm. Yeah, singing in a choir is completely different from being in the audience. Yes, absolutely. Or being in an orchestra pit uh, yeah. versus being in the audience. Yeah, totally different. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what you said earlier, because some of the Germans don't like to have the speaker above them. Yeah. But I mean, if they go out on the street, there's birds flying across, and ah, yeah, there's yeah. planes flying, yeah. so they're getting it from outside. So, yes. what's the problem? Yeah. Did they say why they actually don't like that? No, no. Uh, but it was, for example, from uh, from the studio in Berlin, the U studio uh, in Berlin. Uh, was very was articulating that, and I, I'm I'm not sure exactly why. It is a habit. It's it was a new thing. It's a new way, new exposure. To it's hard to melt speakers. That's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we did these first quadraphonic spatial mm -hmm. illusion, we had the idea of forming it in a tetrahedron. Mm -hmm. Well, the only speakers we have are these huge Altec. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, but, mm -hmm. and so we rigged it all up, and then abandoned it when people realized that it was a 
of, you know, it was a, a could be a deadly device. Mm -hmm. So we didn't try that. But yeah. Yeah, or uh, contacted the premiere was yeah. initially a five channel. Uh, there was a five channel version. Uh, when yeah. I, but I spoke it, to people. It was not above though. No, it was. Uh, yeah, I talked to him about that. And okay. He, he said that that channel has been lost. Mm -hmm. The fifth channel. Yeah, I think initially they mixed it in, into the other channel, so that it, uh, yes. so it is lost. Basically, you cannot separate it anymore. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, we we try to yeah well I, I uh, we try to uh, investigate in that direction but we couldn't get any results mm -hmm. uh, and as we well people who were uh, um, uh, I mean tone masters of this environment they couldn't tell us a clear situation mm -hmm. what happened to the performance mm -hmm. what, was there a fifth channel or yeah. was there no fifth yeah. channel so. so was it modified before the performance or uh, after the first performance? Yeah. So I've only heard the four-channel version once. Yeah. That was at Sark. Oh, yeah. He uh -huh. was there. But I, we performed it with Stockhausen present at the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. We, it was always stereo. Oh, well, yeah. But yeah. the, the four-channel version is around. Yeah. Uh, because the Stockhausen uh, this, uh, is, Yeah, but it was not easily available then. Yeah. It was only, uh, Stereo, yeah. to, without without the the real uh, tape guards that keep the tape on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so if you dropped it, which happened? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, get a wanger. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That works. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, uh, but uh, an interesting thing is that uh, most of the time when you speak about localization, uh, like uh, um, Jens Blauert, for example, uh, they don't speak about sources above your head. They speak about sources on the same level as you are. And uh, uh, of course, obviously, the location, the ability to, lo to locate a signal up there is quite, is not so bad. You still hear binaural. Uh, uh, even though may, some high frequencies m might not get uh, into the ear, but it's better than from the behind, basically, mm -hmm. the, the way to localize. Well, rodents hiding from hawks, they are very sensitive to the vertical dimension. Mm -hmm. But our, our world, there was little peril above the horizontal, so I, that's one of the explanations. Mm -hmm. But we certainly can localize about <coughs> no, where are we then? Let's, uh, yeah, face pulling. That was another uh, uh, observation we made during experimenting with uh, these moving sounds. Uh, that uh, I, for example, I did to, to use the same sounds, put them on the on one speaker, one to one. Then uh, the system using VBUP, uh, and I must confess, somehow this. Debug sounded a bit better. I don't know exactly because it should not be the way. I use that. Uh, um, vector basis amplitude panning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or vector That's based. I think vector based. based. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically uh, an idea um, to a technique to scale uh, loudspeaker environments. And to do that, you uh, create uh, uh, out of this uh, appearance of the speaker, you create triangles. And you have an algorithm which deals with movements inside triangles. And so if the sound goes into the next triangle, you use the same algorithm with different uh, parameters. So if you can extend uh, your environment by adding on triangles more and more and, or uh, changing this triangulation situation. That makes it flexible. So that's what we, how we are working with the ZKM uh, system. And uh, there's a VBUG implementation in the Super Collider in Max already. And I've seen students are using that, uh, it's very quite common. And uh, with that, of course, you have the, uh, the, the, the chance to place a sound, not on a speaker, but somewhere in between. And it calculates the amplitudes for, for that position. And I think f uh, from, the, from the technical point, it should be more clear, the localization should be more clear if the sound is exactly in the speaker. But, I mean, uh, I, th I thought the, the other way was sounding a bit more natural. Uh, 
And then we used uh, the same signals with, uh, in a moving environment, uh, moving the sounds around. And that was even, even more natural. The moving sound was more natural than the stable sound. And I think it is, uh, you know this, uh, uh, if you have a synthesized sound and you introduce the phase modifications like uh, uh, pitch, uh, uh, tremolo, etc. Uh, we, we, we are not used... So if you imagine which sound uh, source is stable in our life, if you walk around, I mean, cars, uh, there are not so many stable sound mm -hmm. sources. Stable meaning on fixed, 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 fixed position. Fixed you have your fri yeah. refri refrigerator at home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. electronics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Hertz. That's true. But uh, it has the fan is moving, uh, okay. so mm -hmm. it has. Uh, I mean, it is stable too. But uh, the the object uh, which creates the sound is moving. And uh, for example, if you have the piano, uh, then the, the the technicians introduced three strings to create a kind of. Uh, that was my understanding of the situation. We our ear want. Uh, um, modified phases. Yes. We don't need stable <coughs> phases. Stable right. phases are dead sounds, basically. Mm -hmm. And the same. What? It's, yeah, auto tune. Auto -tune. Yeah, we, we, our ears do not want auto tune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's a question: Is you know these beatbox people who mm -hmm. do? I wonder if it's possible for a beatbox guy person to do a, a believable auto tune. Anyway, has mm -hmm. having to do with stable sounds that mm -hmm. uh, they do phenomenal things. I've heard some amazing yeah. beatboxing. I can't yeah. believe yeah. what I'm listening to. Yes. 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 If you yes. watch them, you can't believe it. Yes. Um, to, now, did you say that the vector base, uh, that the panning sounded better if you're between speakers than yes. if you're on a speaker? Yes. And then if you're between speakers, uh, you can move it around and make it even more natural. So yes. that, that's the best case. Yes. So, um, now, theoretically, it'll make a difference whether that sound is, uh, you know, tonal or noise-like, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's really kind of a generalization of stereo, right? So it's, it should have all the same problems stereo has. <coughs> so, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, there's sort of a dilemma between um, a, a, an amplitude panning law versus a power panning law. And, and so that, that goes across. Um, um, and there's also higher order vector based panning right, where, where it goes beyond the triangle. So you'll have mm -hmm. more speakers involved and, and you hear the source coming from the center of whatever the group of speakers is that's being used in the, in the uh, linear combination. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's really interesting. And, and that's what the sound dome uses? Yeah, we, we use normal uh, uh, VBAP uh, technology, but uh, uh, for example, for me as a uh, Using this sound, this as a composer, uh, I try to keep all the sounds moving constantly. Yeah. So I, I uh, one approach was uh, not uh, uh, to look that there's no clumsing of sound that 20 channels are on one point. Uh, mm -hmm. Just keep them running somehow in uh, diverse directions so that you don't identify a clear uh, uh, direction of the, the movements and. Uh, that created. That's the same in the gates of uh, in the gates of age and in glass half. Uh, I did. Uh, it's so. It, it's not e really a gestural movement where you would uh, create a motive or whatever mm -hmm. a single sound with a like you did in Torrenas. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's a mo I would call a motive. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. It is just a statistic way to keep mm -hmm. them all moving. Especially diverse. Yeah. And but, yeah. But, but continuously moving, not yes. jumping around. Yeah. Because it keeps things clear and separate. Mm. Yeah. 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 And do you find that you need to, you want to avoid getting right on a speaker coordinate? In other words, you want to stay between speakers, or, or is it, does it matter? Well, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't, uh, well, I thought it's not avoidable. If you, mm -hmm. because if, as soon as, if, if you are in a different speaker environment, uh, you would have to rewrite all the, Right. All the movements. But uh, it's also true that when a source is coming from a speaker, mm -hmm. for however in, for small the instant, it's the one time when everyone in the all the listeners in the space hear the the direction of the mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in if it's in between, you have a you well, know you have depend upon your location. Yeah, you it's warping of the image. For example, you have this speaker, that speaker, and that speaker, and they mm -hmm. create a triangle. Mm -hmm. And even though this is, if there's an ambiguity about the localization, but there is a clear position of that triangle, so everyone in, in the whole, uh, if, if the sound is inside that triangle, we will hear 
the sound coming out of that triangle. Maybe Somewhere the one a little bit up. Yeah. Uh, maybe the other but one. If I'm closer to that speaker, then it'll be way that way. Yeah. Mm. yeah, the way it will, will be yeah. different, but at least there is. Yeah. So that speaks, uh, in, uh, that argues for a higher number of speakers, and a higher yeah. number of uh, the better resolution we have. Dolby decided mm. some years ago. Mm -hmm. That's the Atmos. Atmos, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we were long before Dolby. <laughs> with this mm -hmm. system. Oh, well. we started. I'll tell you with the Dolby story if I can. It's sometime. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway. Okay, uh, I think we're nearly through all of the arguments. Flexible phase correlation. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and that, that is another, the last uh, point is uh, as well very, very interesting because I think there is a. a complex interaction between uh, timbre, space, uh, your position, uh, uh, amplitude, uh, all of the parameters. I mean, how, for example, how uh, strong a certain signal is on top of each of the other signals, which is, uh, um, which is the major signal you are, you are perceiving and, uh, um, yeah, this kind of, we shouldn't, uh, at, at least this interaction is, this complex interaction is possible when you have a complex environment. It is not possible when you have two speakers uh, and mix everything inside the speaker. There is a, there happens an interaction, but it is, first of all, not ambiguous because it's stable. Wherever you, you sit, you will have the same uh, interaction between the signals in, in the stereo uh, uh, version versus uh, the sound dome version, you will have a, a complex interaction between the, between the signal, but with a ver certain variety depending on your perceptive situation. So all, for me, uh, there's, there's many, uh, we can now explain many reasons why it is so attractive to have a, a sound dome like that, uh, or to, to uh, use Let's say if I have a 40 channel sound, uh, to use 40 positions in, in space, uh, uh, even though you think, well, we can distinguish them in any way. If a sound is there, and then the next one's there, we won't listen that uh, if it's three meters above your overhead. I mean, 20 centimeters probably will not be clearly uh, 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 detectable by our ear. But at least uh, these arguments show that uh, there is enough. Um, other reasons to, uh, to incorporate the system like that. And now we are switching back to history. And I try to make it be very fast because we probably know all of that. It, another interesting thing I, was, I thought was the fact that uh, as Salino introduced the uh, polyphonic uh, choir positioning uh, because of a certain architecture. So we, we shouldn't ignore the, the and then, of course, we know the, the interaction between architecture, acoustic, and of course, spatial, a spatial situation. And you, uh, he, could, he was able to introduce these choirs because you have these choruses uh, on the left and right. Uh, you didn't have a centralized position, a centralized stage uh, somehow, because that was reserved. Uh, um, and so he started to. Uh, Compose for these choirs, but interesting is what was the decision? Why is this note going to that choir and that note going to that the other choir? Uh, this is leading to the to what I mentioned before that we are we do not learn how to use space, how to incorporate space into a compositional strategy. But Salino already he developed a strategy. There are simple strategies like you have you know. Uh, solo and tutti. That's a very simple spatial uh, strategy of, of the material, but it can be more uh, more refined, and it has been more refined because they use up to eight choirs in in, uh, in the church. That's really something. Um, then this is a photograph of the Cologne situation, 1956, uh, not a big uh, jump in time. That's uh, Gesang der Jünglinge, and this. I think it was uh, very, I would have liked to be there to see the reaction of the people. <laughs> Unfortunately, there, there is no, nothing, no document, uh, at least that I know, available, only a uh, few yeah. photographs. That's such a WDR, Sensor. Yes, yeah. They have no record of that? 
That's why they know they don't. Well, what what, what should they record? Uh, I misspoke when I said that there were five channels of contact. Yeah. I meant Gizan. Gizan, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the, the fifth channel was somehow lost. Or, uh -huh. but yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, that was 1956. So. We can we can say after the Second World War in the 50s, uh, this kind of uh, electroacoustic music uh, started to to appear. The speaker was there. The separation of the sound from time and space and its origin, basically. Um, and then, okay, it went further to to this one. It's a wonderful photograph of the Xenakis uh, uh, Corbusier Pavilion, and I've. Because I love just the shape of the uh, of the building, so I like to show <laughs> to show this and then. Uh, but the interesting information is in this photograph. Uh, there on the right, you see the implementation of the speakers. Uh, they are kind of paths uh, uh, created by the speakers, and uh, as you might know, there are around 350 speakers, and they had relay. I think relay switches to uh, uh, take the sound to the specific speaker. The original um, tape was, I think it's a, it was three channel. But I'm not completely sure about that. But it was not a two channel, it was at least three channel. Um, and that was dis discovered later on by, by um, his tavla, tavla, who did a big research about that uh, project. And there are simulations by the TU Berlin where they uh, uh, simulate visually and orally uh, the the uh, poem electronique with the movements. They don't uh, they don't have all the information of the movement paths, but they have some some uh, papers where uh, at least excerpts uh, were uh, written. Okay, then the German pavilion, you know, as well because probably it's that that model which led us, in, at least in ZKM, to, to use the sound dome, even though I think there is a certain naturalness uh, reason why uh, 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 a ball-like uh, geometric structure uh, is uh, chosen for a system like that, because of the, let's say, at least in, in the beginning, an equidistance uh, uh, placement of the speakers uh, to the center. Then I know that the, they had already rotations. Yeah, they had the sound mill, uh, and I've spoken to Markus Stockhausen, who remember as a kid he was there, and he remembers that his father was doing this thing. So there was a patch bay, and there you could decide which speaker. Uh, and probably there was a, a you know round contact thing, I would say, and you connect the speaker to this contact, and then this contact was moved by. Uh, this uh, mechanical uh, device, and you could create a rotation with that around all the speakers, uh, the, uh, independent of which one you, uh, which uh, independent of the location. So that's quite something. In, uh, in that was also the model for Sark, I think, the or inspiration. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, but e but Sark is a very you yeah. know is a square. Yeah. Uh, so they at least they used as a model the mm -hmm. sound below the ground mm -hmm. idea. Um, there's some other footage, I, I thought it was so funny because that's a Japanese performance and everyone is nicely seated and the uh, students are sitting there that's opposite to the performance we saw before. Do you know anyone who was present? Okay, again? Do you know anyone who was present? Had ever heard the Osaka Pavilion? At which year it was happening? Or no, no. Do you know anyone who was actually there? Yes, uh, I spoke to Messias Maguashka, who, um, oh, yeah. for example, there were a couple of composers, mm -hmm. like um, one, one other in, in Berlin I spoke uh, to, but um, they don't have a clear remember of mm -hmm. uh, rem uh, remembrance of that, which I find very odd because it's such an extreme situation. But it was the, the case that Stockhausen left them with uh, the everyday business of doing the performances. And uh, so they were a bit, I think, uh, annoyed that they have to do, you know, the hours of playing the <laughs> pieces again and again. And they had the freedom to program them, but they had to play the, the entire pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because Stockhausen was only present the first couple of days and then left. 
And at least you see a hint on number seven, uh, rotation switches for sound moving effects, number seven. So that's where it uh, was located. So that all the elements which were present there. Okay, we shouldn't spend too much time into the historic part. You know, the Pepsi Pavilion had as well uh, 30 something speakers. Uh, this is a mixing board as well as a light board. Uh, it wasn't really set up to use um, the spatial music because mm -hmm. we're in Osaka as well, mm -hmm. also in 1970. And there, that's a placement of the speakers in that as well, in that dome. Uh, but you couldn't, um, there were kind of a grouping or channel limitation, so you couldn't uh, um, diffuse. Yeah, really diffuse them separate uh, the, the channel to each of the speaker. Um, that were they had many sources they could use in, in tape machines. I think seventeen or so. And then this is nineteen seventy one. Uh, Xenakis with the uh, Persepolis. We did that in Karlsruhe too, but this is a, the the re reproduction of the Persepolis uh, placement of the speakers, an exact reproduction of the speaker. But it's basically eight channel chambers uh, and they, these are reproduced. So you have six eight channel chambers mm -hmm. in, in, in that, uh, that means six times eight, 48 speakers. Uh, but it's a classical mixing uh, uh, um, approach. Xenakis has chosen, he mixed just the channels, but used the straight uh, or the uh, way to display the sounds. And then we have, of course, I don't have to talk along uh, about this. Uh, probably this is the only example where you don't have uh, the, the speakers uh, mentioned because it's, uh, I think at that time, either it was a unified, uh, uh, easy to understand speaker environment. And it is a, a limited environment for ch channels that was uh, easier to get than 40 channels, like well, in the... In the, <laughs> the four channel tape recorder is the limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's downstairs. Yeah. 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 Wow. I mean, that was the standard studio mm -hmm. recorder. Uh -huh. But the thing about that, the, uh, that pattern, the Lissajou figure, yeah. and that, it's that the Lissajou uh, kind of an attribute is change of direction, there's deacceleration and acceleration. Mm -hmm. So this was done in real time by in uh, Sinti Chen, mm -hmm. maybe three years ago. They had four performers oh. and they yeah. realized that great, great work. Yeah. And so the performers had a using a, a trackpad to do the spatial, but they didn't. They didn't follow the acceleration and the acceleration, which yeah. is a, intrinsic to the listen to the motion as a function of yeah. sine cosine interaction. So I had to tell them, no, you've got to slow down when you change direction and speed up when. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it would sound like more or less like the original. Yeah. But I would, what I would call the gestural uh, yeah. identity or quality yeah. of. Uh, but of it, it conforms mm -hmm. to the idea of mass. I mean, something in motion mm -hmm. has mass and. Mm -hmm. it, Unless it's a car colliding, mm. they don't stop instantaneously or mm. some object hitting a wall, a bird hits the glass, but they always, like an ice skater, mm. you know, they have to. So that was one of the attractive aspects of yeah. the you figures. Yeah, yeah I, I come uh, later to the fact uh, how to create uh, the movements because uh, we have thought uh, quite a lot about it and we. Uh, work for example with together with uh, Claude Cados uh, using physical models to mm -hmm. create uh, uh, such movements. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know this year talk uh, another approach uh, of multi-channel environment, uh, and this was an, an uh, 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 example. I think it, they used more than hundred speaker uh, in an environment there. But I think I'm not sure how they uh, the, chose the control, how they uh, did the, how sophisticated the control of the signal movements were. Uh, then you have, of course, this way to uh, because 
the acosmonium is, a, is not a, an instrument to cre uh, create a, a place, a position uh, of the sound. It is an instrument to um, do something more abstract or more ambiguous, uh, to create big sounds, small sounds, sounds closer to you, further away, but as well as timbre modifications by, by the speakers. But it, it, at least it was to mention because uh, it, it uses uh, um, s spatial information uh, uh, in, in the kind of resynthesis of the sound. Just another uh, approach of the modern uh, acosmonium, of the current acosmonium in Japan. Mm -hmm. more, more speakers of the same type, not as heterogeneous as, as earlier. Uh, more eight channel circles, uh, etc. Okay, and then we have cytoport zone, I go faster, wave field synthesis system, uh, that was SARC by the way, uh, the, the place of the speaker, the placement of SARC, and allosphere you know, and you would have to add this space as well. This is the TU Berlin wave field, maybe you have seen pictures already. And uh, the speakers, I've worked with that. Uh, I must say, uh, that it was nice for the speakers, uh, for the sounds which go outside behind the wall, uh, but the sound, like the impulse response, is not really uh, strong. I mean, it's, it's kind of blurry. Uh, it has a lot of low frequencies. Uh, the sound quality of a single speaker is still, for, mm -hmm. for my taste, much better. So mm -hmm. I, um, it, it may change, it may be better, but uh, that's the state, I think, of the wave field uh, synthesis uh, installations. Uh, and do you think it was the quality of the speakers? They, did a, they developed the speakers on themselves, they applied, late because there's a DSP in each of the speakers, uh, you know, the uh, speaker, it has, I think, eight channels plus, three times eight channels plus two uh, low, uh, low frequency speakers in one box and they have a DSP in there so that they could apply to all each of the speakers certain filters. Um, so they did a lot of optimization um, and I'm not sure if it's a question of, of the speakers or of the hall which is very large. Yeah. Maybe that is a big problem. Yeah, it's hard to handle a large space. I've yeah. heard that that space is considered too large to really get a handle on. Yeah. And this is what we came up to uh, in ZKM. This is uh, just you know the idea of a couple uh, like here. Uh, oh, how would you say cupola? Or what, how would you say the English word? Couple is something else. <laughs> couple? No. Couple? No. Dome. 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 Yes. dome. Yeah. The idea of a dome. And this is now the implementation in the uh, in the uh, Kubus, uh, which done have. Uh, uh, seen and experienced already. Uh, it's a very nice acoustic, it has wooden material, so it's a nice reflection. You, most of the time the curtains are open. Yeah, really good guy from Luxembourg. <laughs> yeah, but Johannes Goebel did this and it's, I think he did a great job on, uh, on that, the acoustic of that space. Yeah. It's very sensitive, it's very uh, uh, it has a nice uh, transparency of the sound. High frequencies are very strong and they're not damaged everywhere. It's mm -hmm. really beautiful to listen. So we placed some LED speakers on top of uh, LED on top of the speakers to have a kind of visualization if we want to 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 show the appearance of the speaker if, even if it's dark. Mm -hmm. um, that's shown. We have a little dome, 24 channels, yeah. and uh, that's another picture of that, and we have since last September we have a new uh, uh, attraction. I could call it the sound pavilion outside in front of the uh, uh, Kubus, and it was a uh, present presented to us by Team uh, Thyssen Bornewitzer. That's um, you know Thyssen had uh, the largest uh, collection of impressionistic. Uh, pictures and we gave it to the 
to Barcelona or Madrid, to the uh, state of Spain, because it wasn't Bonamista, I think they were Spanish, kind of related. And his daughter, um, she's living in Vienna, she started a new foundation and is supporting media, media art. Uh, and uh, she was, she paid for this, I didn't hear it. it's Francesca von Habsburg Thyssen Bornemitzer. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, so she's a descendant of Thyssen, which has a tradition in uh, Thyssen is a steel uh, German mm -hmm. uh, steel uh, giant yeah. uh, uh, former. Now everything is different. That's way they inherited the money, uh, yes. and um, so she he created her father created this big uh, uh, collection, and then she uh, continued this tradition of mm -hmm. uh, collecting uh, art and and. Uh, Initiating art, mm -hmm. so and uh, she did this uh, project. Who was the name by Matthew Ritchie, Ananda Lush, the architects, and uh, Tony Mai did the sound system. He used the Vibab system as well. But there's something fundamental different on, on this pavilion. It's uh, you will later on see photographs of the size. I just took this one because it's so nice. The, the, it, it exposes the shape. The, it's something. A weird mathematical approach with sort of fractal mm. kind of things uh, applied by the architects. So it was initially set uh, place in Sevilla and later on in Istanbul uh, for one year and later on in, uh, in Vienna, Schwarzenbergplatz. And you see already there is in this environment, this is a large environment, this cannot be one single dome structure. Uh, and here you have it in, in front of the Kubus in, in Karlsruhe. Did you, did you yeah. see that? Yeah, you saw it. Um, and it is basically working this way. Here you have the, the structure from above, and uh, uh, you ha have mentioned all the speakers, but it's not so well, so I try to point out the speakers. So this is one dome, this is the second dome. Third dome, fourth dome, and then in addition to, yeah, to that, you have uh, what we call what they call gates, two gates, so kind of open open dome, not closed uh, environment, and uh, this creates this kind of environments, listening environments, six uh, environments, and they gave uh, commissions to thirty three composers to use this environment to uh, create a strategy using as well ambisonics uh, for some composers uh, uh, to create a different kind of appearance, uh, experience, experience to, uh, to perceive sound because you could for example decide uh, I create uh, something which is audible wherever you are or I create something which is only partly uh, audible and if you want to hear the other part you have to move to the other dome so you can se separate uh, the piece into basically three, four, six pieces uh, and as well it deals with the mixture of that because you hear what is in the neighboring dome or two uh, neighboring domes so it's the, the listener who creates a kind of investigative mix of a certain composition in, in this environment uh, they're using MM4 speakers, Myosound MM4, about uh, 40 MM4 and uh, I think 12 uh, subwoofers, uh, as far as I remember. So around 50 speakers are in this environment. Its, it's weight is something like 25 tons, so it's quite uh, heavy and we had to check before the garage uh, static, uh, um, um, so if it's possible to implement that. There. Okay, and if, if you continue, even these are environments, uh, Jeffrey Shaw's TV scenario, and uh, uh, you have uh, cloud browsing by, by Dinhermann and, uh, uh, and others, uh, you have in visual a spatial, let's say, a, a scattered spatial environment in the new media uh, already uh, uh, appearing. Because this, what you see, this TV scenario is a panoramic structure, and you have up to 140 streams of video, audio, and video, 
and you, you have an interactive device and you can comp point on it and, and get uh, a certain stream of audio video in, in front of you. So that's uh, just a, a sidetrack to what uh, space uh, can, can be used uh, for. I mean, that, that it's not only in the topic in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the music dom domain. And then this is one example of a work we did uh, in real time interactive with the sound dome and the 3D uh, uh, environment where Lintermann created uh, it's, 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 it creates artificial organisms and you can uh, define strategies to modify it, uh, to modify it, to let it uh, genetically uh, 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 develop further and either more com be more complex or less complex than the sound is uh, then uh, displayed according to the properties of the appearance of these artificial objects. So that was uh, one example. Now, we have spoken now a lot about environments, but what we did not speak about uh, the, the, the way how to control sounds. This was Pierre-Henri, this is Stockhausen, the way the simulation uh, of, well, it's not a simulation, yeah, a simulation of the movement. And then you, we had already this in the Osaka Sound Dome, and we came across our software uh, um, because for me it was uh, the idea I want a software that is suitable for composers, easy to adjust to uh, different speaker environments. Uh, I didn't want that uh, um, a composer is creating a wonderful composition in one environment and then can only perform it in this location, like uh, it has been. In former times, it has been, and I think it's the same approach with you with the four channel. Mm -hmm. It is a geni uh, unified uh, environment, and you can uh, transport it to to different locations. And uh, uh, that was the idea to have a practical working solution. You basically take the, I mean, it's very cl clear. You take the speaker uh, uh, information, the placement of the speaker, together with the uh, signals. Uh, or alternatively, um, or um, signal positions, either created in live in real time, or the even the audio signals can be in real time or in non real time. Uh, you could mix everything, and then you output via HRTF, uh, so that you have an easy way to construct the spatial uh, construct uh, the spatial. Concept and uh, or the other way is the uh, sound room. And you have in 2006 was this, uh, no, or 2007 was this uh, project performed. He is using a real time controller, creating the sound in real time too. And with this human data, he's uh, controlling the spatial appearance. <laughs> Interactive table of roughly this size, 
and um, we decided to use um, physical, yeah, kind of uh, a physical model, uh, uh, modeling environment using uh, elasticity um, attractors. This kind of uh, uh, interaction. So you have. Each ball represents one channel of audio, then you have mapped the, the, spe the speakers on top of it. And uh, you could, on the left hand, you could define which strategy, like a positive attractor, negative attractor, or what's the opposite of an attractor? Yeah. Repulsor. Repulsor. Repulsor, okay. So attractor or repulsor, or uh, how, how much viscosity and, and all of this you could define. And it was interesting because it's as well a kind of statistic approach to movement because you apply these uh, rules to all of the channels and uh, that's, that's the, the, I didn't find a better photograph, but that's the, the table and then you just with your hand you touch, uh, create attractors on a certain position and then you keep the sounds in movement. That was one uh, funny, sim uh, simple uh, example. And after having the first version of Ticonium, um, we wanted to extend uh, uh, what we have done, especially because there was one problem. One is uh, uh, recording gestures. And uh, we, we found that the artists really demanded uh, not uh, like a, a linear movements, uh, what I liked about the old system was you had a little ASCII code and there you could ex exactly write down and reproduce in uh, the, the, uh, the spatial concept. Um, when you start uh, recording patterns or recording uh, movements, there's no ASCII code, no symbol, or at least not so... And it's, it's more complex to store these things and to make sure that they work in 20 years or 50 years. And that's, that was my resistance against this uh, more user-friendly technology. Uh, but on the other hand, you, you, you know that the young composers even, they call, don't call it sometimes a work that they're doing. They're doing uh, an improvisation and uh, they're doing tomorrow another improvisation, taking some additional sources and three, in three weeks they do another improvisation. They, they don't have the identity, or many of them have, don't have the identity of a work anymore. So. We thought uh, we should try it, and uh, we came up with a software which is using the Max, uh, Max environment because there's this debug library already implemented, and we didn't have to cope with all the Mac OS updates anymore <laughs> because the Max would, <laughs> would have to deal with that for us. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a big advantage. Um, and uh, we could use the structure of the former system. We could continue to use the structure of the former system. So what you have here is on the left is the, the editor for the spatial environment. Here you play, there you place the, the coordinate of the speaker. You, you put it in and then you create a script and you load the script into the server. Uh, and the server uh, just gets uh, in and outputs. It, gets the input and the information for placing the signal and then it puts it out to the, uh, the amplitude uh, modified signals to the speakers. And uh, then you need some client to create either paths or some real-time information. And this is just uh, so that you see the parameters of the uh, of the speakers, we have the option of mapping it to an ideal uh, 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 ball uh, uh, geometry. So, in, in case you want really a good uh, equidistance uh, of the speaker to the center, and then you, after having done that, you uh, load this into the server and you add on. What is hardly visible is a path editor, and the path editor is a uh, environment where you have different strategies to paint or to um, record uh, or to combine uh, the old way and with the new way. You create events and can create something in, in the event, and then you take this event, uh, export the, si the signal, for example, the moving, the moving um, 
pass, import it again and reuse it and twist it and make it longer, make it shorter, make a cancer, make, make uh, whatever, uh, I mean backwards, uh, using backwards. So you have the chance to use a mov uh, movement as a module and then uh, create a strategy uh, in the composition as a composer to to reuse this and modify this, do it in variations, or you can just uh, um, decide whatever you want. Uh, uh, okay, this the next would be the client. This is one way to interact. This there's a library of small um, uh, Spring Mass systems uh, with with a different setting. And uh, you send this information to the server, uh, this uh, moving information through the path editor to the server. So that's another way to just interactively create or record, if you want, uh, sounds, uh, uh, so locations or paths. And This because I think we have shown or seen this. And another uh, important approach was to use it in, with, to, in conjunction with the DAW uh, system. And it works basically the way that you uh, couple the DAW and uh, to a time code. So the server knows exactly when the output is. Uh, at, at which position, which channel it is, etc., and then it has uh, it gets additional information, which can be stored uh, in MIDI, I think, uh, of the position of the x y coordinates. So you just take uh, two two MIDI values parameters, and then one is the x, one is the y, and, um, and that's how you can store and attach the uh, location information to the individual track because a lot of acousmatic people are working this way um, uh, and with this we have quite a rich uh, uh, way, a rich, uh, should I say, a rich set of options uh, available for the composers. Um, this, I, I thought I might uh, this is a summary of the talk. <laughs> I, I probably should have placed this in the beginning and, and then just skip the rest. Maybe it would be more uh, easy. But I, uh, at, the, at the last uh, part, I just thought I'd show you a video of, uh, it's just four minutes or even less, a video of how to uh, create uh, this, this kind of setting uh, I was describing. There you have input and output. Uh, you, so sound flower, you uh, do the routing internally in the computer. You have already loaded the speaker sets. And then you defined uh, through the uh, inputs already this, uh, the channels which are moving. You see this uh, red, reddish uh, circles, and then you define through this uh, physical uh, object this interface, and uh, I think you have mapped that to. Well, we have mapped that to the inputs, and you can now create an interaction and the resulting movement, and uh, the next step would be to record this into an event and then you could use this recording and uh, do operations on it. Or well, this is another example of a pendulum. It creates a certain path and then you can record it and uh, so it's what I like about very much about this is it is a very physical uh, way to generate movements. Uh, it's, it's not a very it's not artificial it's a very uh, a way which uh, uh, accepts uh, the rules of mechanics. That means is what the process you you mentioned, speeding up and uh, slowing down, is logical. It's inside a logical context. Or 
inside the logic we, we, we know, uh, we experience. Okay. Newton. What? Newton. Newton's law. In Newton, yeah. What does the size of the uh, source bubble indicate? Is that the amplitude or...? Uh, no. I think uh, it is the, probably the, the, the weight of the bubble. Could be, it okay. could be the weight of the bubble. Mm -hmm. And the, the tools that you show um, are, are 2D tools? Um, how, how does this map into the 3D of yeah. perceived sound in the sphere? Yeah. Uh, VBAP is actually a 2D, it's not real 3D movement of sound because you have a, a geometry, like the dome, and the sound can uh, only move on this surface of the, of the dome. So, but since the surface is in three dimensions, it, it looks like it's a three dimensional movement. So it actually it's really a, a two dimensional movement, but I must say, I, I didn't find that very. Uh, problematic because in textbook it is always said we don't use Weber because it's only 2D and we, uh, Rayfield is much more interesting. Uh, I completely disagree because they are so it's much more complicated the argument, the pro and contra uh, uh, arguments uh, in this field. And you can still use intensity to make it apparently closer yeah. in uh, direct reverberant ratio. Yeah. Yeah. So you still have a lot of control. Yeah, yeah. and for example, even uh, sounds with their natural timbre, they some appear to be closer if they have high frequency, if they have left this high frequency. There is anyway uh, interference between the timbre quality and the, uh, the, the, the distance to you. Mm -hmm. Do we have to close? No, because I'm not the orchestra is coming in. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I hope... Uh, uh, I didn't tell you s too many things you no, already knew. No. <laughs> Why don't you go for a few hours? Thank you. Yeah. This is for the 4,000 people. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>